good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our first webinar in this two-day webinar blitz. The webinar will begin shortly. My name is Karen Brinson Bell. I am a member of the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center consulting team, and I will be your moderator for today's session. The Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center and Fair Vote partnered with the Center for Civic Design to conduct a usability study about ranked choice voting. This webinar and the webinar tomorrow will review the findings from phase one of the study. The presenter of this webinar is Topsy Ramchandani. Topsy is a civic anthropologist currently studying the politics of civic engagement for her doctoral thesis, uh, excuse me, dissertation, and she works with the Center for Civic Design. Before we bring Topsy on, let's go over a few housekeeping matters. Participants have been muted for this webinar to reduce audio interference since we have a large number of attendees. If you have technical issues, please use the question option to send a message to the organizer so we may try to assist. Handouts are available in the Handouts tab of the control panel. To expand or minimize the control panel, click the orange arrow of your webinar taskbar. If you have a question or comment regarding the webinar, please type that message in the question box. Alternatively, you may email your questions or comments to info at rankedchoicevoting.org. To keep this webinar to about 45 minutes and out of respect for your time, there will only be a brief question and answer session at the end. Questions we are unable to address, to address during this live session will be answered in a follow-up document, which we will email to attendees and also post with a recording of this session on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website. Now I will turn it over to Topsy to share the findings on designing ballots for Ranked Choice Voting. Thanks, Karen. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Civic Design, I am thrilled to be here and share some of our insights with everyone who's listening on research that we've been conducting on ranked choice voting materials for over a year now. So um, just to get started, let me start by saying that good ballot design along with clear instructions can reduce errors and help voters mark their ballots as they intend. When we started this research, uh, we had three main research objectives. We wanted to learn how voters understood ranked choice voting. We also wanted to discover how confident voters felt in how they voted. And then we wanted to find ways to make voting easier for all. So um, when we started this, uh, te started testing for our um, for ranked choice voting, we focused on three different types of materials. We looked at paper ballots, we looked at ballot instructions, and we also looked at prototypes of digital ballots. What you see on the screen here are two types of uh, paper ballots. These are two out of four different styles that we tested for. Uh, we have the optical scan uh, style ballot with the option to rank three candidates. We also had the optical scan ballot with the option to rank six candidates. That's the one in the middle. And then we had the newspaper column style ballot. Um, as you see, it runs down the left column and then it starts back at four, five, six on the right side column. The two other types of uh, paper ballot styles was the standard grid style ballot that a lot of you might be familiar with already. And then we also tested um, for a hand entered uh, style where you could actually write in uh, the rank for different candidates. As you see from the screen for our paper ballot instructions, we actually tested uh, a myriad of combinations of both illustrations and text that together conveyed information on how to mark a ballot. I'll talk a little more later in this uh, presentation on the use of icons and imagery, but for now let it suffice to say that we tested both a vertical layout that's on the left and we also tested a couple of horizontal layouts on the right. Uh, we also tested uh, different combinations of illustrations with text. Some just had one illustration with a lot of text, some had three illustrations with um, accompanying text. 
We also tested, um, uh, we did actually, this was preliminary testing with an existing sorting program on the left that is called Optimal Sort. We wanted to test a drag and drop ballot, so we had our participants uh, move candidates of their choice from the left side column in Optimal Sort um, to the right side based on their preferences. We also tested paper mockups of the Anywhere ballot. I'm happy to talk more about what that is um, at the end of this presentation if we have time, but we had paper printouts of um, how ranking would take place on the Anywhere ballot, and we had participants go through each of those pages with us as well. So uh, just briefly how we conducted this study. We used a combination of observations and interviews to learn about our participants' experiences. We conducted usability testing uh, in the, from August to November 2016, so over four months. Uh, we tested in three states, Northern and Southern California, in New Jersey, as well as in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We had over 50 participants participate in our sessions. All of them were over 18 years of age and they represented a range of voter behaviors. We had engaged voters, we had voters who were first-time voters, and those who considered themselves to be sporadic voters. As they interacted with our materials, we observed their behavior, their emotions, and their actions, and once they had filled out the ballot, uh, we also conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with each participant that lasted approximately one hour. So I have two key discoveries to share with you um, that came out of our testing. The first one is that many different paper ballot variations worked. There was one, however, that absolutely did not work. So the grid style, the optical scan, both uh, rank three and rank six, as well as handwriting in rankings, uh, different participants preferred all three differently. However, almost everyone did not like uh, the newspaper column style ballot. And uh, the reason became pretty obvious to us during our interviews, and that is because people read left to right. So they would rank uh, the first candidate of their choice in the left-hand column, and their eye would naturally go to rank four on the right side. Uh, thinking that that was rank two, and this was problematic for a lot of our participants who did not like um, who did not like the style because it was not intuitive to them. The other big key discovery that we made was that text and icons work very well together. For starters, they reinforce each other. So what you read in the text is reinforced by the image you would see that accompanied that text. It also appealed to a wider demographic, and this is because people have different preferences. Some people are visual people, other people are text people, and it worked for all of those demographics. And it also worked really well with low literacy voters, people who would rely on imagery, um, especially if they are having a hard time following information in text form. So let me get to uh, the meat of this presentation, and this is recommendations and things that you can implement um, in your own uh, ranked choice voting materials and ballots in particular. An overarching principle is to start with best practices for ballot design. Uh, we used uh, best practices from the Election Assistance Commission, as well as the Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines requirements for accessibility. Uh, that these two were our starting point for the ballots that we tested. So all the different, the four different ballot styles uh, were all um, updated with these design principles before we actually tested. And what that allowed us to do was to focus on other details, like the language in the ballots, uh, as well as um, the combination of text and illustrations in the instructions, for example. So a guideline here uh, for using best practices is uh, using typography that would make the ballot easy to read. Uh, it is important here uh, to mention things like, uh, you know, avoiding centered type. So as you will see, everything on the screen is left aligned. That is normally how we read uh, information and it's important to be consistent with that. Uh, also, we recommend making the text large enough to read, so a size 10 or a size 12 uh, are ideal font size types. 
Uh, we also used bold to highlight the candidate's name over the party, as you will see on the screen. Uh, it also We also used it uh, to differentiate between the contest, the mayor's contest and the city council contest, for example. And do use clear font, si a font type that has minimal decoration. So for example, the Helvetica font si type, uh, Universe, Arial, Verdana, Clearview, uh, all of these uh, will prevent a voter from getting distracted and just trying to figure out what is being said um, on a ballot. Another guideline is to use visual design to attract attention and to separate contests. This is very important because uh, it is very possible that a ranked choice uh, contest uh, is on a ballot that also includes other contests that don't require people to rank, so it should be easy to decipher between contests so participants know when they're jumping between them. Uh, you want to identify each contest in a consistent location and use shading to make the heading visible, as you see on the screen. You also want to make the rankings easy to see. Uh, we used a larger bold type, uh, so people easily could see first choice, second choice, third choice, and fourth choice, and this really helped them uh, figure out where they were in the ranking process. And we used color shading and even bold thick lines to separate contests. Another guideline is specific to a digital ballot. On a digital ballot, you only want to have one contest per page. Uh, and this is uh, useful so that people know that they have uh, the option to scroll if they need to scroll, um, and op also not get confused between different contests. However, if a layout does um, not accommodate one contest per page, then as before, you want to make sure that each contest is clearly separated you want to make sure that the contest at least uh, fits on, in a single column, and this will prevent overvoting where people might think that two different columns means two different contests. Uh, each contest should have equal weight on the page so that uh, the smaller contests are not overshadowed or hidden by larger contests. And you want to make sure that navigation between contests is controlled by the user, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this in the coming slides. Another guideline is, uh, again, specific to the digital ballot. You want to use a vertical screen orientation rather than a horizontal screen orientation so that you can fit more candidates on that page. This is especially important when you have elections that have a lot of candidates. It's uh, much more intuitive to scroll top to bottom than it is to scroll left to right. So you want to arrange the whole screen, but especially the list of candidates in a single column. This is also a strong recommendation for accessibility. Uh, purposes for voters with low vision as well as low literacy. Another big overarching principle is to use clear, concise instructions that would help voters avoid errors as they are marking their ballot. One of the guidelines here is to put instructions where voters need them. Um, so what does that mean? That means that on a paper ballot, uh, where people are reading top to down, you want to put instructions at the top of the ballot so that they encounter the instructions on what to do and what not to do before they actually mark their ballot. On a digital ballot, because you're moving between screens, you want to make sure that you have instructions at the top of each contest so that the instructions are reinforcing what a voter should be doing every time he or she flips to a different page or contest. You also want to use informational icons and typographies for emphasis. Here we used uh, both bold so that voters know that they have to mark at least one candidate for their vote to count. We also used exclamation marks that worked really well in um, highlighting key pieces of information um, amongst everything else that was mentioned in the instructions uh, box. And if you sparingly, icons actually are pretty useful in drawing attention to uh, important details and uh, in combination with bold, I think, with, the, with using bold, uh, that should get the emphasis out there. Another point I want to make here is don't just tell voters um, how to avoid mistakes, but if they do make a mistake, give them the option of how to fix that mistake. 
Another guideline, uh, this one's for a paper ballot. You want to use illustrations along with text uh, for how to mark a ranked choice ballot. Uh, so you could show one correct way of marking, and we tested that, and that worked really well, uh, where the box on the top shows you how to correctly mark a ballot, and then it has uh, the instructions below it. Uh, when you write down instructions, make sure that each instruction has its own separate paragraph. It is easy for people to follow points when they have their own paragraphs, especially when they give different pieces of information. In the bottom, you'll see three different illustrations. Uh, one of them is how to correctly mark a ballot, and then you have two illustrations on how not to mark a ballot. This also worked well um, with a couple of participants. What I will say here at this point is, uh, whichever combination you use, you have to be very careful about not going overboard with the text. Uh, one participant, when we were testing, was pretty confident. He thought he knew what he had to do to mark his ranked choice ballot, and then he read the instructions and all the texts and uh, what not to do and what to do. And then he nervously asked me, he said, am I missing something here? Why are you giving me so much information? What, what don't I understand? And so I guess the point here is you just want to be judicious in what information you provide. Uh, and you definitely want to have at least one illustration with accompanying text uh, on how to mark a ballot correctly. For a digital ballot, uh, it's important to show the voters' progress in ranking candidates. On the left screen, uh, you see while um, a participant is making a selection, the person who's, uh, who's just selected is highlighted in blue. And on the right side, on the review page before a ballot is cast, you have um, all the rankings that have been made by a participant uh, show up in the order of ranking. You can also, at the bottom on the right image, you can see that there is uh, information that says you have ranked five candidates and you can still rank up to three more. And this allows voters on a digital screen to know if they have any choices remaining and if they want to take any action at that point of time and go back to a previous um, screen or contest at that point. Another big overarching principle uh, is specific to the digital ballot. You want to give the voter control of all interactions. Um, you know, using a digital ballot should be simple, it should be straightforward, uh, especially for people who are not familiar with computers and people with disabilities. Um, it is good to not jump steps. So as much control as they have over what is going on will make them more confident and make them feel at ease as they're going through the process. So here, um, what I want to say is you want to have visible controls for all actions. Uh, if you see on the screen here, uh, once you've clicked on a candidate, you have the option to move the candidate up in ranking, down in ranking, or remove the candidate from that ranking entirely. And this worked really well with people that we tested with. Uh, and that is because people did not like uh, rank to automatically adjust itself uh, once you um, once you gave a candidate a rank. And uh, having visible controls like this uh, clearly tells the user what actions are possible and what he or she could do uh, during the ranking process. These visible controls are also an important tool for accessibility because they provide targets for interaction that can be easily identifiable using audio instructions which, uh, which voters could depend on. Uh, and here, it would be advisable not to use a uh, drop-down list to number ranking, but rather to have them move people up and down manually, one step at a time. You also want to provide a review screen where voters can confirm and change their choices and rankings before they actually cast their vote. Um, this is really important so that people have a good sense of what they've done. It also lets them know if they have actually missed a couple of rankings and can go back and fix that. We also have these yellow buttons that you see on the screen uh, that let voters know that there are more options. So tap there if you want to scroll up to see what else is there or tap down if you want to see other candidates in the city council race um, in this example. I mentioned this earlier and I will say it again, uh, it is advisable not to automatically reorder candidates uh, when we used optimal sort. 
um, the drag and drop program as a very rough prototype to see what uh, participants thought of that. They did not like the fact that the moment they dragged the candidates from left to right and they released the button, it just organized it. It just put it wherever the mouse happened to hover and uh, gave that person a rank. Um, they felt less in control in that interaction. And so when we tested the, proto uh, the paper prototype of the Anywhere ballot where they could see that there are options to manually move ranks up and down, uh, they preferred that over the optimal sort. Uh, of course, but at the review screen, you do have the option to reorganize candidates in the order of ranking so people have a clear understanding of who they marked one, who they marked two, and who they marked five. You also want to give voters the option to leave candidates out of the ranking, and I cannot emphasize um, how important this is. Um, how important this was to participants that we have tested. In fact, even in recent testing that we have done, this um, the anxiety over how many do I have to choose and do I have to rank all is an ongoing um, discussion that we uh, have had with participants who filled out a ranked choice ballot. So voters had many diverse and strongly held opinions about how many candidates to rank. And for those who did not want to rank candidates, there should be an option for them to leave candidates out of that process. And so on this screen, what you see is a um, up to six candidates who have been ranked, and then there are three who have not been ranked, uh, two who have not been ranked, uh, who show up at the end of that screen and are also not uh, grayed out or uh, who are not gray or blue, letting them know that these are people who didn't make it into the ranking process. Uh, I want to tell you a little uh, snippet here uh, based on research that we conducted. A 54-year-old participant, she's from Orange County, she's bilingual, and uh, you know we were talking about this, uh, how many to rank and how little to rank and what she thought about that. And she put it rather crassly. She said, well, you know, rank choice voting, oh, it's a, it's a ranking system from favorite to least favorite. You know, it's like a beauty pageant. Um, if you don't like one, you don't have to vote for her. And this is how she made sense of the choices that she had with the ranked choice voting. It was a beauty contest. And you just pick the one that you like, and you leave out the ones that you don't like. And you know, this was her way of looking at it. And it signaled to us that it was really important uh, to participants like her to have the option to not have some people um, be a part of, of the race, of the running. Uh, at this point, I just want to um, uh, say that we are actually testing a working digital prototype of the Anywhere ballot in, in January of 2018. So uh, we're basically upping the game from our paper prototypes to a uh, workable prototype. And we will be testing this in California and look forward to getting feedback from participants as they actually uh, use the Anywhere ballot to mark their rankings and hopefully refine the program uh, in the process. Uh, you can find our full report on best practices uh, for ranked choice voting, uh, our ballot design, as well as detailed information on our research findings and methodology on uh, rankedchoicevoting.org. And for general best practices and guidelines that you can use in a variety of context, uh, contexts and many different materials, I encourage you to check out our field guides for ensuring voter intent. You can find them at uh, the web link listed here, but you could also just Google civic design and field guides and you should be able to easily find that information. And I think I'm well within my time. You're well within your time, Topsy. Thank you so much. Uh, that was very insightful and has sparked several questions. And but before we get into the questions, I just want to point out to all the attendees that today's presentation has been recorded. And we will hold a brief question and answer session in just a few moments. But just as a reminder, the recording and supplemental Q&A document will be posted in about a week on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website. Uh, we'll also be emailing it out. Also. Our next webinar on voting systems capability and ranked choice voting begins at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And the registration link 
uh, was part of the email alert that went out to everyone. It is a separate registration, even though it's all part of our two-day webinar blitz. Uh, for now, I'm going to moderate our Q&A portion of this webinar. I'll let folks know that we have Topsy available for questions, and her uh, we have Whitney Quisenberry from also from the Center for Civic Design that's on standby if we need her insight, and from the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, Gary Bartlett is available to answer some questions. I think the first one we've got would I'm going to direct to you, Topsy, and then if you need to hand off, certainly at any point, um, feel free to do that. If we have if we had limited time and resources, what is one suggestion you have for improving basic ballot design? I would say focus on um, your headers and use shading to separate contests. It was um, it, participants responded really well to our ballot design layouts. Uh, like I said, we tested four different ballot types and in each of them we had already used best practices before we even tested. And so quickly participants were able to were able to know whether this was a mayor's contest, whether this was city council, whether this was US represent representative, and that was because we had wonderful gray shading behind the word mayor or city council, so they knew it's a different race. Uh, we also had um, thick lines around each contest box that allowed uh, participants to differentiate between contests. Uh, and we also used a bigger, bigger text size and bold. And I think these are some quick fixes uh, that you can make to your existing ballot layout that won't require any investments in anything much and uh, you know, should be easy to do in any program. Those are very good suggestions. Um, having been an elections administrator, we are often looking for those little fixes that will help um, improve ballot layout and design. So whether it's ranked choice voting or any, those are some good suggestions. Uh, the next question is actually uh, one of, from one of our participants in Washington State. The question is, in a grid RCV layout on a paper ballot, they note, would there be a benefit in including the applicable choice number in each oval to reinforce the corresponding column heading? I would say no. And that is because a grid layout, when we tested this, uh, the grid layout was overwhelming for a lot of participants. I realized that voting, um, voting machines, a lot of them use the grid layout. and. Uh, so it's useful to to work with the design and to see how to improve it. And having the the numbers in the ovals just creates a lot of text on that page. And already when we tested, we try to use spacing. We try to space things out so things weren't that cluttered. Uh, but we had I think 12 different um, candidates on that grid. Uh, on the grid style material that we tested just to see how far people would go and how easy it was for them to figure out which candidate um, they wanted to rank in which column. And that was hard to begin with. Uh, they could do up to three or four, but as you went down to eight or nine, people were getting really frustrated um, with having to navigate that. So I think adding numbers in the ovals might complicate that process even more. I've got a, a, a note from Whitney here too. Whitney, do you want to chime in a little bit on this as well and add to what Topsy said? Or do I have you muted to where you can't? I think that yeah, should open was, you up, Whitney. <laughs> I was just going to add that the, the challenge of putting, I want to say two things. One is that, uh, to reiterate what Topsy said, is that we have seen people when we tested some of the current grid style envelopes, which have very tight grids, almost as tight as an IBM card or a computer card. When we opened that up and gave it spacing, it was much easier to, to, to track up and down the rows and columns. But the other problem is when you fill in the bubble with even a you know, pale number, there are two problems. One is that if it's too pale, it's an accessibility problem. People simply can't read it if their vision isn't good. And if it's too dark, then it's in danger of being picked up um, by the um, 
by the, the scan software. And the third is that when we talk to people who are low literacy or lower engagement, haven't done you know standardized tests all their lives, mm -hmm. uh, they think that when there's something in that bubble already, it's already done and that they don't, it, it sort of conflicts with the instruction to fill in the bubble. One thing that you might do if you had a really long list of candidates would be to duplicate the numbers at the bottom so that you have a, a way to sort of see which which rank column you're in from the top or the bottom. But the spacing was the most important thing. And I just wanted to add one more point here. What, we, what I showed um, in one of the slides is we bolded first, second, third, fourth um, in the column. So in addition to actually having first choice written vertically, which is difficult to read to begin with, but needs to fit in that tiny space, we had the, the, the numerals. Uh, bolded and written and highlighted there as well. So people hopefully would have a who have an easier time navigating and trying to figure out that column is for which rank. And so repeating just going off of Whitney's, if you repeat that at the bottom as well, maybe that could that could help um, voters navigate. Great. The next question um, looks like it's been touched on by a couple of people, so I'll just ask it in general. Is there a ballot style that won hands down in your testing? Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, we have not done a systematic quantitative study uh, to say definitively that one ballot style worked over the other. That said, uh, for reasons that involve limitations of voting systems as well as familiarity with a ballot style, the grid style was favored by a certain number of participants, but in our specific testing, rank three actually also ranked really high up there. And the rank three ballot, which is basically the optical scan ballot where uh, you have the option to rank three and all the candidate names are repeated in three columns. And that worked, I think, primarily because voters, a lot of participants that we spoke to wanted less choice. They liked the fact this was within their scope of how many to rank, they knew who they liked the most, they knew maybe a second best, and they knew their third. Uh, and so it really fit well into their expectations of what they could do or wanted to do. And so the rank three worked in that in that respect. It's also less to rank. It's also uh, laid out very simply. It's just three columns, um, and that's it. So I would say the rank three and grid style were on top of the pile. Do you want to talk about um, what's coming up in December? Yes. In so in, to that. Yes. So in December, what we are going to do is we want to expand. We actually want to work on exactly this question: Is there a ballot style that works hands down? Uh, and so we're going to be testing three different ballot styles, um, uh, including the rank three and the grid style, to see. Um, uh, if there is an overall preference. So we're hoping to get more numbers for this. So we're looking at about you know, 80 to 100 uh, participants coming through and testing these ballots and then filling in a survey as well as doing a quick interview with us on uh, which ballot they prefer and why they prefer it. So we should have more clarity, at least in terms of numbers, for, for people who, um, you know, for whom numbers resonate well, uh, do have some clear idea on if there are preferences. And if there are, then why is there a preference? Yeah, this is Whitney adding in. Um, we, what we didn't do in the testing we did was a head-to-head -head of the, the three best layouts of these three ballot styles. And so this is what we'll have a chance to do. We'll also be asking questions to help us understand why it is they might have liked one over the other. Uh, there's another factor I think that's worth considering, which is uh, in each jurisdiction, what kind of ballot are your voters already used to? I mean, that's an issue. Obviously, if you're locked into certain kinds of equipment, that can be an issue. Uh, the other question is, is ranked choice voting a new concept? So uh, is it, uh, in you know, there are a few places in the country where, the, where people have been doing ranked choice voting for a long time. But in most jurisdictions, even when we went someplace where ranked choice voting is already in place, uh, not everybody was that aware of it. They might have heard the words, they might have actually voted using ranked choice, but they hadn't, it hadn't gotten into their bones and their DNA yet. And so thinking carefully about uh, where your voters are coming from 
and what kind of um, elect election context they're moving into as you introduce ranked choice voting, if you're indeed introducing it, um, uh, is part of the equation, not just what's uh, objectively the best. I had them talk about the December testing and so forth, just to make sure everyone's aware that you know what we've presented today deals a lot with phase one, and we do have phase two of the usability study. It also um, is a reminder because some of the remaining questions that we have, I think, are going to be more addressed in phase two than what we know in phase one. But I'll I'll put the questions out there so that we're all aware and can add in. Um, this next question, I I know that I want. Uh, Topsy and Whitney to give their perspectives, but I also want, if you will, hand it off to Gary um, after you give your responses, Topsy and Whitney, um, because I know that it relates to some, some things we've been working on with the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. So it actually comes out of Maine. Do you have any data that can shed light on whether voters can be confused by multiple voting systems on a ballot? I think we would say multiple voting methods. Um, but nonetheless, if there are multiple voting methods on a ballot, such as RCV for mayoral election with plurality for the city council election. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on this one. We don't really have data on that. Um, what we do know is that when you switch voters from one, one voting method to another, you need a very clear break on the ballot. It's why, for instance, we suggest that the instructions for the ranked choice voting come immediately before a ranked choice voting contest, um, especially if uh, there's other contests on the ballot. But the same thing applies, say, for a switch from uh, judicial, you know, uh, regular contest to judicial or into a vote for end contest, even in a standard uh, winner-take-all uh, election. There is some uh, less anecdotal evidence from the UK where there was an election shortly after 2000 where they had three different ballot papers, one for London, one for the UK, and one for the EU, all of which had different voting methods, and there were a lot of problems. So I think the key to, to when you're mixing things is clear differentiation on the, battle, on the ballot itself and good uh, voting instructions on the ballot and good voter education to prepare people in advance. And one of the things that we're trying to do in this uh, in phase two when we are testing to see which ballot style people prefer is perhaps mixing the ranked choice voting ballot uh, with other contests to see in the larger scheme of things, in the ecosystem of voting where voters are likely to encounter more than one type of um, voting on the same ballot, which one do they prefer and which one flows easier compared to others? Gary, are you available to? I am very available and I would, uh, I would like to share our experience in North Carolina in 2010 and other jurisdictions. Other jurisdictions have mixed ballots and use them very successfully. What has been shared previously is correct. You need clarity with instructions and layout, and you also need to ensure that you provide some upfront education. In North Carolina, we had our ranked choice voting offices on the general election ballot, and we placed the RCV offices together in the non RCV offices uh, together so that they were separated. We were able to provide a page of instructions in a voter guide that went to every household. And as you know, only those who are civically engaged would read something like that. So to help those who did not read or did not care when they showed up at the polls, we had someone, some election official or polling official at the polling place or the early voting site give them oral or written instructions saying how to mark the RCV ballot. We did not have any issues in looking back over how uh, the ballot was marked. We were surprised at how few mistakes that they were. To give you an example, in North Carolina we have an auditing process where I picked this office to do a hand-to-eye count 
and an independent statistician told us what uh, precincts or one-stop sites or mail absentee ballot counties to count by hand, and there were surprisingly few mistakes. In fact, uh, I, I, it, I was just overwhelmed with, with surprise. So it works, but you've got to be clear and you've got to uh, provide some type of instructions to the voter and the best time to get them is when they, right before they are to vote. And, and to give you an example, in 2010, most of the ballot sizes in North Carolina was 11 by 17, and there were three counties that were 11 by 20. So that shows you that there was a long ballot, and it worked. Thanks, Gary. I'm going to give you one other question, and then we'll have time for about two more. Uh, so questions have been great today. We are not going to be able to get to all the questions, and they keep coming in, but please keep sending them, as I've mentioned. We will put these into an actual supplemental document, and we may even expand on some of the answers that we've given today, and we'll be sending those out to you as attendees and to others um, in our contact list. So be on the lookout for that. But while I have Gary, I want to touch on a question that's come in that may actually help you lead into what we've got coming up at 3 o'clock, but it's the question of have any of the voting equipment vendors worked with you on this? And we can also let Whitney or Topsy chime in if need be. I would say that uh, all of the major voting equipment vendors at some point in time have had in-depth conversations with myself or other members of our team. They have been extremely helpful and that their doors have been open. Could not ask for any better cooperation. And I'm talking about uh, Unison, Dominion, ESNS, Clear Ballot, Microvote, and uh, have I left off any, uh, Karen? Hart, Intercivic. Hart, yes, Hart, Intercivic. Eddie Perez has been very helpful, and uh, he's head of the technical side of Hart. Uh, one other thing that uh, maybe uh, Topsy or Whitney can also addressed that I'm very interested in the second phase is some guidance when we might have voter fatigue. To me, I think that is the most interesting question that, that I would like answers for and best practices. You know, voter fatigue is a really, <laughs> yeah, voter fatigue is a really complicated question. Um, and I really hate the name because I think that uh, we know that people who are eager to do something will go through it even if it's long and maybe even a little difficult. And that people who are not engaged in it get um, disengaged faster um, when, there's, when there's problems. So uh, the, the challenge I, I see is that uh, it, overall we can't control how long the ballots are. That's sort of well, out of, well above my pay grade anyway. Um, but what we can do is think about um, how we handle ranked choice voting. And there's no question that we need, that there's going to be a balance between enough choices and too many choices. Um, if you have five candidates, then having a five by five grid is really probably quite fine. When you have 31 candidates, a 31 by 31 grid would probably not be so fine. So. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer except to say that there's some kind of obvious choices there, but I also suspect that we will be in every jurisdiction circumscribed by the election code. So maybe this is, uh, first of all, it would be a great it would be a great thing to do some some retrospective analysis on, but also to make sure that election codes are not written in a way that requires you to do a full ranking if there's a huge number of candidates. Uh, I do know what we tested the grid style ballot with. I think it was 12 participants. Uh, there were a handful who did fill out all 12. Most did not. So without committing myself to anything, um, from a from a voter's perspective, 
between three and six was what we saw most people fill out. Um, of course, you have people on the extremes, the ones who absolutely will only rank one because they liked one or um, fill out the entire, um, uh, uh, fill out all the options available to them. But I'm just, just based on the limited research that we have done, you know, between three and six was what they, was what a lot of people fell into. And this comes back to a point that Topsy made earlier, which is making it clear that the number of rankings to do is the voter's choice. So uh, if, if a voter chooses or is, is so engaged in the election that they want to rank them all, that's great. But if they don't, they have to feel that, they are, that it's okay for them to have the say they have and stop when they're done. Yeah, and this is a really good, um, uh, it's also something that I'm going to be talking about uh, in the webinar tomorrow, which is on voter education, and both the ballot instructions as well as the voter education together need to constantly reinforce that ranking is a choice, and that was just consistently an issue and a question that came up in our testing, whether we were testing voter guides or whether we were testing ballots or whether we were testing ballot instructions. How many can I vote, and will my first choice be affected by my second and third choice? And just to prefigure something Topsy's going to say tomorrow, it's important that that message be consistently communicated across all of your materials. Um, even slight changes in wording can make people start to think, well, maybe this means something different. So once you decide how you're going to say it, say it, say it again, but say it consistently. Well, your answers just then actually touched on a, a couple of other questions. So I'm going to not ask those for our final question. The final question will, out of the many, will be, have you tested landscape versus portrait layout for the ballot, for the paper ballot? Um, noting that if we did landscape, that um, they could accommodate more rankings, especially in a, a grid format. We did not. No. Um, in part because we were um, uh, f part of our focus was could we make a ranked choice vote voting ballot that would work on the most standard, most common ballot design, which is the portrait layout three column ballot. Um, and we did want to know if there was any, you know, if there are any uh, warning signs that this was a really ineffective ballot. We wanted to know that. Uh, so we did not work on the good ballot turning it sideways. We did test on some pretty wide pieces of paper. Uh, so the width of the largest grid we tested on was 15 inches, I think. Uh, so it's almost as big as a, as a legal size piece of paper. I would really caution against going to something that's 20 inches wide. That's a long way for the eye to track. Well, thank you, Topsy. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Whitney and Gary, for your added insight. And thank you, attendees, for being with us for webinar one of our uh, three webinars in two days. Uh, we are going to log off here in just a moment so we can get set for the 3 p.m. Eastern Time webinar on voting systems capability and ranked choice voting. And as Topsy mentioned, we have another one tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time where Topsy will present on voter education, voter guides, and also uh, RCV election results presentation. So thank you again. We will work uh, diligently to get these all these questions answered in a document and out to you along with the recording. And we appreciate you being with us this afternoon. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.